We have seven Catholic principles to guide us in our decision making in regards to housing. And these principles are guided by scripture, by Catholic doctrine, and by our Paul Street Journal podcast. The seventh principle that we have may surprise you. It's about plastic siding. Is it unsustainable? Is it ugly? Or is it both? Wait till the end to find out. Today's episode will be a challenge to pretty much every listener because society doesn't exactly coincide very well with Catholic principles. The principles today are not meant to condemn what we do, what we live in, our past actions, but instead are meant to inspire us in our future actions. They're meant to make us make the right decision going forward. That's today. right. Don't look back. Do not look back. Look forward. Right, right. Our very first principle is the dignity of the human person, which we've talked about before. Yeah, so every human being is non-repeatable, made in the image and likeness of God. And we spent quite a bit of time on this in a previous episode. So season one, episode three, you could check out the link where we explain that in further detail. Exactly, right. So bouncing off of the dignity of the human person, we have the second principle, the universal destination of goods. Because every single person has infinite dignity, they have the right to the essentials of life, and that includes the right to land and to a home. Walk us through the Catholic understanding. Well, there's, there's different philosophies for achieving the goal of every human being having land and a house. What the church suggests is that we operate in a free market economy that has rather rough edges. So the rough edges of that free market economy are softened by principled people inspired by the gospel practicing charity. And the Catholic Church is also very supportive of governments being involved. Right now, the laws are favoring landlords in, in a, a number of ways. We're talking about tax deductions, mortgage interest, depreciation deductions. Landlords are leveraging the equity that they have in one property to buy another and buy another. And what that leads to is more landlords, more renters, and less people owning their own property. The solution to that is this principle of distributism. And Pope Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum, that's episode one, check it out. He says that the law should favor ownership and induce as many people as possible to become owners. So in that environment, what, what we would see politically and legally is a shift in that it would be harder to rent land and houses to people, and it would be easier to acquire land uh, for yourself. And the focus there is private property, which brings mm -hmm. us to our third principle. The church gives a lot of emphasis to private property as this tool for bringing about the universal destination of goods. That's what private property does. We want everyone to have that which they deserve because of their dignity. Mm -hmm. And private property, as mentioned by the popes, starting with Pope Leo and after, and even back all the way to scripture, is kind of a way of bringing that about. One thing that Pope Leo says, which I think makes sense of this idea of private property, is that one's land, or he says little estate, is essentially someone's wages in a different form. Private property is the storage of past labor that puts you in a position to sustain a family into the future. So it, it connects the past and, and the future with the present, and it serves as the foundation for a good financial model for a household economy, oikonomia, mm -hmm. and also for the foundation of a family. What the Catholic Church recommends for the last 120 years is a lot different than what we get from laissez-faire capitalism, which leads to renters, mm -hmm. and what Marx and Engels and other socialists would encourage, which is taking private property away from people and making all land pu public. Right. And private property is pro-family, and that leads us to our fourth principle, which is the primacy of the family. We talked about it in season one, episode three, right here. And what essentially we've said is that there needs to be a priority or a value given to your family members above other things, especially in the kind of consumerist society or culture that we live mm -hmm. in today. One thing I think about is the need sometimes or the feeling of need to go work somewhere else away from your family to go chase a high paying job. Mm -hmm. But scripture kind of pushes us the other way. It puts family in the center and it kind of shifts the way we should think. So how does that affect our housing choices? We as Catholics need to make a decision. Are we going to be careerists, 
just moving to wherever pays us the most? Or are we going to maybe make some career sacrifices to stay close to the people that we are related to, that we depend on, and the people that depend on us? Mm -hmm. So those are two very different ways of thinking about life in general. A true Catholic is eagerly seeking the bonds of the family. I think connecting the previous principles with this one, the state has a responsibility to help the family with policies that have families as their end goal, right? Yes, uh, Pope John Paul II would, would agree with this, and, and he says that if the family is the basic building block of society, and strong families turns into strong societies. Mm -hmm. So if, if we live in a society where having a family and raising a family becomes harder and harder, society is going to slowly break down more and more. Absolutely. So I have a question. So if we should be pro-family, wouldn't chasing a high-paying job, even if it's elsewhere, be more lucrative for your family? Can't you send them some more cash to pay the bills? What would being near your family have over a high-paying job? I think we have to admit that sometimes leaving where you were born is necessary to survive. And the church supports that. It, it actually says that people have a right to move and to migrate if they absolutely have to. So we have to keep that in mind. But we also have to know the cost of leaving your family. And it's more than you might think. And that leads to the next principle, locational stability. We talked about the careerist who's willing perhaps to move, but let's not also forget about the migrant who perhaps needs to move. Let's talk about what life is like for the modern isolated nuclear family. This is an invention of the industrial era. It was only sustainable for 10 to 25 years in the middle of the 20th century. But basically, the modern isolated nuclear family has an impossible amount of tasks to complete on a daily and a weekly basis that is unsustainable. Think about yourself if you're married or plan on being married, both parents working full time you have to go grocery shopping. You have to cook your own meals and eat healthy. Frequent the sacraments if you're a devout Catholic. You have to stay fit by working out. You have to take care of your house and your yard if you have the private property. <laughs> you have to be a good spouse, a good parent. You have to be a good family member. That's like a son, a brother, an uncle, a godfather. You have to be a good friend. Most people have a lot of friends. <laughs> You have to be a good participatory member of society. You want to pray. You want to go to church. You want to read, learn, grow, relax. Is it possible no. to do this on your own as, as a couple? The answer is no. And for most of human history, no one expected that. And the end result of the modern isolated nuclear family is that they just let some of those important things slip through the cracks. Mm -hmm. They either give up on their health. Some people even give up on church or even their family. That's without locational stability. So with locational stability, and I'm not talking about just a nuclear family, but an extended family, there's the opportunity for helping one another. And this isn't required, but, but one thing that is ingrained in Catholic culture for the last 2,000 years is multi-generational households. So I don't live in a multi-generational household, but I live within very close proximity of my in-laws mm. And I experienced many of the benefits of this. Think about sharing one roof or one physical property with multiple generations. That includes grandparents, parents, and children, like three generations or more. While the parents are working, the grandparents could help take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. If somebody is sick or disabled, there's more helping hands. If an elderly person needs care, instead of them being alone and dependent on, let's say, professional or government help, mm -hmm. The family is able to, to provide some or all of the long-term care. There's the shared life. Think about the, the benefit of sharing space with grandparents, the wisdom that comes from that. Shared expenses. Tax bills could be halved. Saved expenses. Th think, think about the cost of daycare. Families are spending just as much on their daycare as they are on their mortgage. Think about the cost of long-term care. I heard of a retired couple that decided to go on a cruise for 52 weeks a year because it's less expensive than assisted living. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so all of these costs are saved. So yeah, you could move and be, be a careerist, make more money and send that home, but that leads to relational isolation. Mm. Oftentimes your kids growing up without knowing their grandparents. And what's the cost of long-term care if you're not taking care of them? What's the cost of childcare? Mm -hmm. So 
it better be a really good job if you're moving. <laughs> There's costs to careerism. And as Catholics, we have to think bigger than what's normal in society and have a, a historical perspective and also a very pragmatic perspective. We're not meant to be on our own. So I think these kinds of benefits extend beyond even your own household and into your community. We've talked about this mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. investing in where you are from. Mm -hmm. And that starts mm -hmm. with your family. And then that extends even to your local community. And I think that brings us to the, the sixth principle, which is solidarity. We've talked about solidarity before, specifically in season one, episode two, which you can find right here. I, I think it's a, a principle that rather clearly ap applies to housing, especially when we start talking about that which extends beyond your family, your neighborhood, your community, and how you should also invest in that. Yeah, investing yeah. in your own home kind of leads to investing in your community. Private property is not a mechanism for you to have what you need and more so that others can have less. It's about having what you need so that you can help others achieve the same. If you have the opportunity to acquire more and more land and to turn that into rental income for yourself, that would be not as good as finding ways to use your good position to help other people acquire their own private property. If you have private property, there's also an element of solidarity where you should be thinking about your immediate neighbors, your neighborhood in general, your city, your town, and concentric circles moving out further and further. So if you ever watched the very funny movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the family, they live in a normal neighborhood with normal houses, and then their house is like a palace with fountains and marble statues, and it doesn't fit the neighborhood whatsoever. <laughs> so th they're trying to impose ancient Greece upon their neighborhood. <laughs> but that's not a great practice of solidarity. We mm. should think about, okay, well, this, what's the character of my neighborhood, and, and what's the character of my region, and how is my house and property going to fit and build up that community, mm. that neighborhood? How am I going to make my property beautiful and appealing? Uh, how am I going to keep it up so that it increases the value of everybody's experience? And I'm not talking financial value only. I'm talking about the transcendentals, right? right. The beauty, especially, mm -hmm. of your house. Let that be a contribution to your neighbors. That's a beautiful way to kind of practice solidarity in making mm -hmm. your neighborhood and the housing in your neighborhood beautiful. It's possible to measure the health of a society by how well kept and how intentional the shared spaces are. So if you live in a society where the individual houses are great, but if the central town is falling apart or if it's cheaply made, that's a sign of a rather selfish, individualistic society. A healthy society has maybe a little bit more modest homes and rather grand central squares and churches and Investment in communal space, that's usually the sign of a healthy society. Mm. Sustainability is our seventh principle. And we talked about sustainability most in our episode about Pope Francis, season two, episode 10. But all the popes before Pope Francis talked about this. We like to say that private property could and should lead to sustainability. That which you own, you work harder for, you love more, you take care of it more. Mm -hmm. It's not just private property alone, but it's private property plus locational stability that leads to sustainability. Let's say you are buying a house just to flip it and make a profit. That's not going to lead to sustainability. You're probably going to use cheap materials. You're probably just trying to maximize profit. Mm. That's not sustainable at all. But if this is a house that is multi-generational and that will last for many generations to come, what that's going to lead to is people using healthy sustainable materials, materials that are probably more repaired than replaced, mm. things that last. So that is going to be a sustainable model and lead to a, a healthy ecology. Yeah, the, the important piece is the locational stability because it mm -hmm. contributes to taking care of your private property over time. And improving the property. Yeah. Making it, it more beautiful. Right. Making it more productive. Right. And especially over generations. We're thinking about the primacy of the family that includes your descendants. Yes. So you would want to invest your time, your effort, your love into your private property so that your following generations can enjoy that. Yeah, right? and that philosophy is a philosophy of stewardship. Mm. You're receiving something and then you're going to be giving that away 
It's yours, but it's not. It's a gift, and, and you're taking care of it for just a temporary time. Right. So that's a very different philosophy than just consuming. Right. So what are sustainable materials? Materials. It's it's wood, it's metal, it's stone. Mm. These are the materials what that about plastic. So plastic would be a, a less sustainable material. I know that in New Jersey, if you take the plastic siding off of your house, you could actually recycle it, but it's going to take a ton of energy to to go through that recycling process and it's a consumeristic wasteful material hmm. when if you have stone or wood it could simply be resurfaced it might be more expensive but it's going to last a lot longer and this is more of a multi-generational way of thinking you, you know the story of the three pigs <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a good better best here i'm not recommending that somebody if they have plastic siding or asphalt shingles that they immediately replace it but next time around, when it comes time for replacing, it might be worth choosing a material that is more repairable than replaceable. Like we've mentioned earlier, the point of this episode isn't to condemn past actions. Mm -hmm. and, and you recognized in the middle of the episode that there's a capacity is a real thing here. If you're going to replace the siding and you can't afford the next thing, there's no one compelling you. We're not suggesting that you must mm -hmm. use a more sustainable material than that which you can afford. These, but, are, but, these are principles we're providing, right. and then you should do your best. Right. Operating with your conscience that is informed by Catholic social teaching, the principles, this one being sustainability, it's a good, better, best. So you should just always try to do your best and to always improve. I think that's right. I would like to talk about the standard of living, which might even be a crisis in the United States right now. I have a 2,000 square foot house and, and a family of five, and somebody once said that that's tiny. That person may have had a very high standard of living that depended on oftentimes unsustainable materials and maybe even being house poor. Mm. So that standard of living that is maybe unsustainable includes enormous amounts of square footage that these properties have to be built and cleaned and maintained, and that, uh, that's very cost prohibitive. There's also this idea that every kid needs their own room and their own TV and their own iPhone, and I think that this is all just like over the top mm. nonsense. Oftentimes, when kids grow up with their own room, once it comes time to share a room in college with a roommate or they get married and have a spouse, they don't know how to share space, and, and that becomes a challenge in their marriage or where, wherever else. Mm. So. Learning how to share space as a kid isn't bad, mm. and you don't need a big house. I think a lot of people have set a standard for themselves that is unattainable and arbitrary. And I think that kind of standard also leads to this isolation that mm -hmm. we've talked about, right? If yeah. each person in the house has their own room and phone and TV, it's also going to lead away from the primacy of the family. It's going to push everyone into their own little corner. Another important feature of your house is that houses are built in certain ways, in certain locales, for a reason. If you live in the southeast United States, it would be very normal to have a roof that goes several feet away f from your house. And the reason for that is it creates extra shade and a sunny environment, and they also get a lot of rain. And, and the rain drops far away from the foundation. Mm. While... In the Northeast, it would make very much sense to have a really sharply pitched roof because the snow, if it sits on top of the roof for too long, the weight of it could hurt the house. Mm. So these aren't arbitrary stylistic decisions. These are environmental adaptations mm. that make sense. So when an, a modernist architect wants to build a square house in northern New Jersey <laughs> and they get four feet of snow, they're entering into a battle mm -hmm. with nature. And yeah, it might have some aesthetic appeal, but at the same time, it's against the nature of the conditions that we are in. Some of these classical styles of architecture are more than just stylistic. It's sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, and it's impressive. A lot of those styles are also aesthetically appealing, mm -hmm. but they work. It's, it's a mixture of aesthetics and practicality. Right. One last thing under the category of sustainability is proximity. What the church has been against, and Pope Francis has some pretty strong comments against living in a concrete jungle mm -hmm. and families being crammed into tiny apartments and how that's not good for family life. But at the same time, living 45 minutes away from your job and, and spending an hour and a half commuting every day or traveling great distances to 
grocery shop or whatever is a challenge. So it's best to live your own life and to build societies if you're a civil engineer that reduces the amount of commuting and distance between the things that you have to do every day and often. Ideally, you're living close to your family or with your family, extended family, multi-generational households. Ideally, you're living close to work. We're hoping to be inspired by the gospel and by Christ to move forward and to, to practice these principles because that's when we are at our best. That's when we are most human. This is mm -hmm. what makes us thrive. The principle of good, better, and best can really guide us because sometimes we don't have the capacity to do the best thing, but we should always try to do the right thing, the good mm -hmm. thing. That does it for our Catholic principles on housing. Let's put them into practice and see you next time on the Paul Street Journal.